1 Corinthians chapter 10. This morning, you know, the title of my sermon is, is, is How to Tame Temptation. How to Tame Temptation. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at uh, verse uh, 12. The Bible reads, Wherefore I let them that thinketh, yeah, that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. There hath uh, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Uh, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will, uh, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be, uh, be able to uh, bear it. Wherefore, my, bro- uh, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give my voice strength uh, to be able to uh, uh, preach without coughing, without uh, any hindrance, but be able to preach your word um, boldly the way that, uh, the way that you uh, have spoken to us, Lord. And Lord, I, th- I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we begin to read these you know, kind of things, we're going to uh, learn how to tame temptation. But one of the things I want to ask you, how, does anybody know how an Eskimo kills a wolf? Does anybody know how an Eskimo kills a wolf? Well, what he'll do is that, and the reason why he kills a wolf, obviously, is for an endangerment you know, to his family, to his children, to the, the community. So the reason why he kills, you know, that's the reason why he kills a wolf. But what he will do, uh, do is that he will repeatedly coat the blade in blood, allowing it to freeze until the entire blade is covered. So he keeps on applying more and more blood, frees it, and then applies more blood, freezes it until it's all the way covered completely. Then what he will do, he will place that knife in the snow, and as the wolf comes, the wolf will smell that and begin to lick the blood. His tongue is then numbed, and his hunger is intensified. The, the, the wolf will lick the knife and cut off his own uh, tongue. And eventually he will bleed himself to death out of his own lusts. Because of that fact, he won't realize it, he won't know it because he's going to become so numb that he won't realize it. And the thing is, is that Satan uses the same tactic to defeat God's children. He knows that he can, uh, he can never have your soul but he also knows that he can cause us to succumb to, uh, to, to temptation, then we will become powerless and useless as believers. He knows that if he can get you uh, to give in to that temptation, that you're going to be powerless and useless at that moment. Salvation is not a barrier or it doesn't stop temptation. Do you know that once you become a believer, temptation doesn't stop? It only continues and probably intensifies. So on the contrary, Satan is more likely to attack a Christian than, uh, than a non-believer. Than an unbeliever. After all, he's already, he already has a lost person, but he loves nothing better than causing one of God's children to fall into sin. He loves doing that because of the fact that he is able you know, to sit there and laugh before God and say, See, another one has fallen. Another one has fallen. Another one. And think about it. What ends up happening when you have like a, a, a leader of a church or a pastor of a church that has fallen into sin and comes before the church? What does it do? It splits the church. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does that through temptation. But temptation, while it cannot be avoided, can be overcome. While it is hard to endure, temptation can be used to help us grow in Jesus Christ. I believe every believer needs and wants to know how to turn t- uh, temptation into triumph. When temptation arises, usually there are three ways that we respond. The primary method for most in dealing with temptation is to simply give in to it. Many people live by the, if it feels good, do it. We know that mentality, that's how our world is nowadays, that if it feels good to you, go ahead and do it. If it's okay for you, it's fine, right? But sadly, many Christians do this as well. They just give in to temptation. They don't try and fight it. They just say, you know what, there it is. I'm going to you know, just give in to it. Others struggle against temptation daily. They spend all their time 
fighting temptation, and they never win. Why? Because it's in their own strength. They fight and fail over and over because no one can overcome the evil, uh, their, our evil nature alone. If we could defeat the power of sin in our own strength, then it would have been pointless for Jesus Christ to die for us in the first place. If we could do it all on our own, why would we need Jesus? Why would he have to die for us, right? This type of person hates what he does but goes on doing it because they, ha uh, they do not have the power to stop because they're trying to do it in their own strength. We see this struggle that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, Paul goes back and forth over and over again, and he finally comes to the and says, all the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I, you know, that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And he comes to the point where he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can escape this body of death? But remember the next verse. It says, Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit and not after the flesh. So finally, and the last group is, there are those who overcome uh, temptation through the uh, power of Jesus Christ. They turn their temptations into triumphs, you know, and this, you know, for a lot of us, you say, Pastor, that's kind of wishful thinking. I don't see how that can even happen. But I want you to know that you can win over temptation. It is possible to live in victory. There are a, a few things that you need to know, uh, that you need to know to be able to do this. So this morning, as we talk about how to tame te temptation, the first area I want to look at it is the subject of temptation. The subject of temptation, or who is affected by our temptation? Who's, who's affected by temptation? Everyone. Everyone is. You say, everyone, everyone, including Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's impossible. How would Jesus Christ be tempted by, isn't temptation sin? It is not a sin to be tempted. Everyone is tempted. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For, if, for we have not a, a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus Christ was tempted. He, just, he didn't give in to it. And, you know, we are, we are daily assaulted with a wide range of temptations. And we all have one area that we are particularly susceptible to. Not everybody has the same temptation because Satan knows what each of us you know, go through. He has the notes. He knows how to get you. And it's not the same way. Where one person may struggle with lust, the other person you know, struggles you know, with eating or smoking or drinking or a foul mouth. Our greatest danger is to think that we have arrived at a place that we're, uh, where we are above sinning. I have met people that said, you know what, man, me and Jesus, we're so good, whatever. I don't think there's any way that I could sin. That's a bad position to put yourself in. Because, I mean, look at verse 12. It says, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. When we think that we have arrived, you better watch it. When you think that you're, you're good and everything else, you better watch it even more. So say, you know what, everything's been going well. I better pray even harder. When, when our pride tells us that, that we cannot fall, then we are headed for a huge downfall. Pride in this area just tempts the devil. I mean, think about this. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says this. Pride goeth before the fall and a haughty spirit before a fall. When we get so arrogant and so proud in, our, in ourselves that we think that we cannot fall, that's when, all, that's when we do fall. Every, every um, a failure in ministry, every you know, failure as, as far as you know, leadership and everything else has always fallen when they've gotten too big for their own britches. And they didn't think, you know, they didn't think, uh, you know, nothing of it. They thought, you know what, I got this. Nothing's going to happen to me. 
you know, and I'll be fine. And what ended up happening, they had a huge fall out of that. This past week, my daughter had asked me a question. And at the moment, I, it just, I, I just, I guess, never really thought about it, but then looked into it. She asked this question. She says, why doesn't God just kill the devil and just end it all? I was like, that's a good question. Aren't you, like, aren't you glad that when kids ask, you know, I mean, my daughter, you know, uh, most of the time asks me, like, good questions. I have to think when she asks me, you know, whatever, because I'm like, you know, I was like, I haven't really honestly thought about it. But why doesn't God just kill the devil and remove the attraction for sin? Wouldn't that just take care of everything? Would everybody, I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? And this is what I found, that if that were to happen, then you and I would lose the ability to be overcomers in Jesus Christ. Without opposition, there is no victory. God has not called us to a life of ease, but one of victory. A victory that, that we cannot enjoy until we have faced evil and overcome it. We must realize that we live in this world. We are not of this world, but we live in this world, and we must overcome. Only by Jesus Christ can we do these things. And I would love you know, to say, you know what, yeah, God just you know, uh, kill the devil and you know, be done with it. But that's not what he wants us to do. He wants us to overcome. He wants us to depend upon him in order to beat temptation. That's what he wants us to do. Number two, the source of temptation. Where does temptation come from? Well, in verse 13, we see this in uh, uh, of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. It says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. So when it says it's common, you know, don't think that your temptations are so great that you can't handle it. And they are just like ones that we all face. They are just common, run-of-the-mill temptations. We all get the same ones, for, but from, you know, from same, the same sources. The same source is where? We get our temptation from the devil. We also get it from, and I'm going to go into this, we get it you know, from the world, we get it from the devil, and we get it uh, from our sinful nature. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, For all that is in the, uh, in the world, the lust of the flesh... And the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. As I said, there are three primary sources of temptation. The world, the flesh, and the devil. So let's look at these three sources and see how they will attack us. The first one, the world. Just so you know, when you see you know, in the Bible, the word for world means system or order. When He's talking about, you know, that... We, you know, uh, he's talking about that in First John two uh, two sixteen. He says, "For all that is in the world," he's talking about a system or an order. The Bible speaks of this system called the world and says that it is evil. In verse fifteen of First John, uh, First John uh, chapter two, it says, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world." James chapter four verse four says, "Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God." But it is, po you know, it is possible for believers to become so worldly that they fail to stand out for the Lord. We are, called, we are called to be different and distinct. We are called to stand out. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. In a world of darkness, you are called to stand out. You are called to be different and distinct. We are not... A we are not to allow the world to force us into its mold. We don't follow what the world, that's why the Bible says that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. In Romans chapter 12, it talks about the, uh, it talks about the fact that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Then it says not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Matthew chapter 5 talks about that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light of the world, that we don't, you know, that if we have a light, we don't, you know, put it, you know, take a basket and just put it over top of, you know, over the light. What's the point of that? Or if salt has lost its saltiness, then it has no use, right? 
But we are to be different. We are to bring flavor. We are to, you know, um, bring those things out that people need to see. We need to realize that the world's identity of beauty is something that, you know, is disgusting. The world's idea of beauty is something, you know, that is not what God has designed. For one thing, we look at when uh, King David is, is first anointed king. He, uh, you, uh, you have Samuel the, the prophet who goes uh, you know, down the line of all the brothers. And he gets to David. And all the other ones, they say, are you know, you know, stronger, bigger, better looking, all these you know, things. And David uh, comes along and he says you know, that he's small and ruddy and doesn't really. But what does he say? He said, God looks at the heart and not the outward appearance. The world's idea of beauty is best, uh, uh, you know, spoken of, and I have the wrong, I have the wrong verse here, let me look it up. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, you can turn there with me as I'm turning there. First Peter Chapter 3, verse 3 says, Whose adorning, let it not be uh, that our adorning of, of plating the hair and of wearing of, of gold or of, of putting on an apparel. He's saying basically, you know what, don't sit there and just try to make yourself look all this. You know, there's so many things out there where they want you know, women, to, you know, women and men to have this put together look all the time. Or this fakeness. Um, you know, I see so much, like, I, I mean, I thought, honestly, in my mind, I thought Tammy Faye Baker was horrible with her makeup. Then I see some nowadays, and it's worse than Tammy Faye Baker. I used to say that Tammy Faye Baker used to take a paintbrush, you know, a paint roller, and just roll it on. Well, these other ones are, I think, they're just dunking it over their head and just putting so much on. Because, you know what, they're all trying to cover up who they really, truly are. They're trying to cover, cover up the beauty that God has created in you. And what we need to realize is that all that stuff, that people sit there and they go, man, you know, and, they, and people lust over the, you know, the opposite sex or they lust over different things. And what, when the time comes, all of that has to come off. And then are you going to be scared when all that comes off? Because you can only dress up a horse you know, so good before you find out that it's actually a horse. God's idea of, uh, is inward beauty of the soul untouched and unspoiled by the taint of the world. That's how God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be you know, uh, soiled and messed up by sin. He wants us to be innocent. He wants us to be different. I heard somebody you know, said that a youth pastor had asked, them, had asked some kids one time, they said, do you think, it would, you know, uh, they asked them a question, would you have rather have grown up in the church not knowing anything, or have had a life full of sin, and then get miraculously saved. And they said all but one kid, all but one kid had said that they would rather have a life full of sin and have a miraculous testimony. That is sad. It should be the fact of that we should so desire our, our children, and our children should desire this, that, that they would be untouched, unspoiled by this world. That they should be pure and holy and not have to have, you know, a life ravaged with sin and then be like, oh, miraculously, they came out of it. No, because you have to deal with all that stuff later on in life. I thought it was, you know, amazing that my wife, you know, got saved at age five and never had to deal with that stuff. And I praise God for that. I say to my detriment, I said, you know, I told people before, I said, you know, I would have rather, I said, I rather had godly parents who raised me in a godly home going to a godly church than for me to go through the stuff that I went through. I would have. So, so for your children and your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, encourage them to remain untainted by this world. Because you know the stuff that you still struggle with because of something, you know, because of your life, uh, you know, your life ravaged with sin before you decided to get saved. And if you grew up in the church, you know, untainted, your parents brought you to church, 
and you, you, you continue to live that life, you got saved when you're young, praise the Lord that you did not have to go through all that stuff. Right. Amen? Amen? That's why I'm so thankful for uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Bobby and Miss Pat and my wife and all those that work with the children's ministry, you know, like Ashley and them, that work with the children's ministry to try and teach them that at a young age. Because that's important. That is important. We talked about the world. Next, the flesh. The next source of, uh, of temptation is, is the flesh. That each of us, every child, every adult, has a, has a bent or a leaning towards sin. That we, that we, uh, that we inherited because Adam sinned. It is called the old nature. The old man. Not that Adam. He's an Adam way down the line. Sorry, Adam. But there is a civil war that is going on in the heart of every single saved person here today. We see this explained in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, that says, For the, the, the flesh lusteth after, against the spirit. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, or fight, or you know, are at odds with one another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In other words, there's a battle, there's, there's a war going on. Your flesh is wanting to fight against the spirit of God. Back and forth. That's what you're fighting every single day. There's that civil war that's going on. So when we fail, we try, we try to blame our sin on the devil. Yes, he tempts us and he points us to sin, but, he, uh, but we are responsible for the final decision. He can sit there and tempt us and point us towards it and say, look at this, look at that, you know, this is the greatest, whatever. But it is our choice. We are responsible for that final decision of what we're going to do. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is the father of lies, and that's what he does. After he lies to you, he tempts you, and he points you towards it, and then you know, when you give in to it, what does he do? He accuses you. You're not really saved. How could, how could, God, ever, you know, how could God ever really love you? You keep doing the same thing over and over again. God must hate you. What does he do that for? Why does Satan do that for? Because he wants you to be uh, uh, useless and defenseless, and he does not want you to realize that, you know, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He doesn't want you to realize that, that if, you ask him, uh, if you ask him to forgive you, that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. That if you confess that to him, If you look back at you know, verse, 13, uh, verse 13 of chapter 10, what does it say? In the latter part it says, But God is faithful, who uh, will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but uh, will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. God gives you the way out. Just because Satan tempts you and he points you towards it doesn't mean you have to follow it. The Bible says that, you know what, he's not going to give you more than you're able to handle. For somebody, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I don't know if I can handle any more. I don't think I can take anything more. No, God's not going to give you any more than you can handle. You can handle it. But it's in who you trust is how you handle it. If you keep on saying, I can't handle it, yeah, you can't. But in Christ Jesus, you can. That's who we need to depend on in that moment where we say, you know, I don't think I can handle anything more. I don't think I can take it anymore. Everything, you know, my family's coming against me. My friends are coming against me. All these things, my job is coming against me. All these things, I don't know what to do. I can't handle it. You can't. But in Christ, you can. The third source is the devil. His main objective as far as you know, what we are concerned is, is to cause you to fall so that God is dishonored and you become useless for the kingdom of God. He knows every weakness that you have, and he exploits them trying to get you to sin. He tells you how great that sin will be, 
that you will be able to get by with it and that you even deserve it. But realize this, he hates you and he's plotting your defeat. He loves to point at fallen saints and basically laugh before God as he stands accusing us of the evil that we just did. Do not give him that satisfaction. Do not give him that satisfaction. Realize that he's going to do these things. Do not give into it. He, God will give you a way of escape. How do I know that? Because his word says it. You do not have to give into it. Now, I, you know, like I said before, I'm not saying that we're going to be sinless. But we can overcome temptation. We talked about the source of temptation. We talked about, uh, sorry, the the subject of the temptation, the source of temptation. Now we're going to talk about the seat of uh, temptations. This is the how. Now realize, man is made in the image of the triune God, right? Man is a triune being. He possesses body, soul, and spirit. When you're tempted, it will always be in one of these three areas. And we need to understand this principle and, and understand the areas that will come under attack, uh, attack if we are going to overcome temptations. The first one, the soul. This speaks of the mind, the will, your emotions. This is like your conscience. The world is, is, in, uh, the, world is the primary tempter of the soul. The world says to the soul, you need more, you can have more. You have to have this. The world also appeals to the, the ego or your pride. That's why the Bible says pride goes before the fall. A worldly saved person is one who is given over to the pleasures of this world. Who do we see this? Who's a great example of this? Lot. Lot is a great example of this. Lot looked, he leaned, he lived, and he was lost in the world. How do you know this? Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 13 says this, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord, uh, be, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the, uh, the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and, and they separated themselves the one from uh, the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the uh, the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So you have Abram and you have Lot, and they're both, you know, one says, if you want this way or this way, you choose, you pick it, and if you pick that one, I'll take the other one. Lot has his pick, and he says, I want that one, which contains Sodom and Gomorrah. So he looked, he leaned, he lived, and he lives. And it says that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Did he have to do that? No. You say, well, what's the problem? The next part of that, it says, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And for those that say, you know, why is God so mean in Genesis 19 where he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah? He didn't give them a chance. This is their chance and they never, they never do. They never decide, hey, I want, to re- uh, I, I want to turn away from this wickedness that I've been doing. They keep doing it. That's why they're destroyed in Genesis 19. But that's besides the point. A worldly saved person it, uh, is one who is given to the pleasures of this world. He's watching what Sodom and Gomorrah does. When he goes down to, uh, to lie down in, in bed, he's looking towards Sodom. When he's waking up in the morning, he's waking up to Sodom. All these things, he's got his mind and his focus upon Sodom. Everything that he sees, he wakes up, there's Sodom. Goes to bed, Sodom. For some of us, we sit there and we wonder why our kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews are doing the things because they have pitched their tent toward Sodom. And you say, how is that? Watch TV. Well, Blake, don't watch TV. 
if we have all, you know, you know, video games too, you know, video games, TV, any of that kind of media, a lot of that stuff is shown in there. The stuff that they were, the stuff that Sodom and Gomorrah were doing, we're watching it on TV and paying for it. We're paying for video games, you know, $50, 60 $70 for a video game. I'm just talking about the game, not the system, which is like $500. We're paying for our sin and, and enjoying it. Am I saying that every single like, video game out there is the worst thing ever? Am I saying every single TV show out there is, is wicked? No. no. But watch the commercials. Don't watch the commercials. The commercials are you know, worse than you know, a lot of the TV shows. You're sitting there saying, you know what, hey, I just want to watch like, you know, Andy Griffith. That's why I like having like a DVR so you can just kind of fast forward you know, all through you know, the DVR and just get all the way past all that. We cannot sit there and think that if we're constantly putting in Sodom and Gomorrah, that Jesus is going to come out. You say, well, I'm saved, you know, whatever. Remember, just because you're saved does not mean that temptation is stopped or there's a barrier. Lot is saved, and what does he do? He pitches his tent towards it, and we see in Genesis 19 that, you know, he almost gets to the point of... I mean, think about this. His mind has gone so bad by Genesis 19 that when you have the sodomites beating at the door to try and get in, you know, so that, that way they can have uh, relations, uh, you know, with the men in there, what does he do? He gives his daughter. I mean, how does that, I mean, you say, well, how does that, I mean, why would he give his daughter? Because he decided six chapters prior to that he was going to pitch his tent towards Sodom. And you know what? Some part of him in his mind, because his mind had gotten so blinded by what he saw there, so desensitized that he said, you know what? Have my daughter. Number two, as far as, uh, you know, we talked about the soul, now we're going to talk about the body. The body obviously refers to the old nature, referring to the old nature, always, um, the flesh always, Sorry, the flesh referring to the old nature always attacks the body. How are we tempted? With laziness, lust, overindulgence, sexual sin, the temptations of the flesh. I mean, think about David and Bathsheba. David was was supposed to be where? He was supposed to be out fighting in the battlefield. And he wasn't. He decided to stay back home. Then he sees, which I don't understand this, why you would have a woman bathing on the roof. I don't understand that. But that's where she was. And he looks out and he sees her. He's tempted, but then gives into it, and it makes his life even worse. Because of the body, because that he was allowing that temptation to captivate himself. The last one, the spirit. The spirit uh, spirit is the primary arena for satanic attack. If the soul is our our conscience, uh, then the spirit is the God conscience. Our spirit is what sets us apart from animals. I want to lay this out for you really quick. A little side note. This is the reason why animals don't get saved. And they don't go to heaven. I know that for some people you know, that hear that, they go, well, what do you mean? I have Rover over here. He, he, you know, I think he should be in heaven. He's not. Why? Because he doesn't have a spirit. I'm sorry to break your heart on that one, but that's what it is. Man alone is the only one that can know God. It is in the spirit that we, uh, that we can know God. I mean, think about you know, what it says in John uh, 4.24. It talks about that we worship in the spirit and in truth. And the, the spirit uh, you know, that worships and communicates with God. Satan ha- uh, hates the fact that we have this communion with God, and he wars against the Spirit in an effort to cut off your, uh, your fellowship with God. He doesn't want you to maintain that relationship, that fellowship with God. He wants to cut it off. He places doubts in our minds to, to distract us. Is that really God's word? Did God really t- uh, say to do that? Are you sure that this is the, you know, what you should be doing? He places false doctrine 
there to turn us away from the truth. Satan attacks the spirit. I mean, think about it. In Peter's denial of Jesus, the temptation was, uh, was directed at the spirit. He wasn't, in, uh, he wasn't undergoing a, an ego attack or some sort of sexual assault. He was caused to doubt the truth. That's why uh, in, uh, when he denies Christ, he's doubting the truth of what Jesus Christ has already told him. We talked about the subject of temptation, the source of temptation, the seed of temptation, and lastly, the subduing of temptation. This is the overcoming. There are three words to remember when facing temptation. Flight, faith, and fight. Flight, faith, and and fight. We need these to be able to overcome. To overcome the flesh, we need, to, uh, we need flight. The key to defeating fleshly temptations is to flee from them. That's what it means. Flight means to flee. The Bible you know, speaks of this in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6. It says, flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 10 says what? In verse 14, it says, flee idolatry. 2 Timothy 2 says, flee useful lusts. You cannot expose yourself to fleshly temptation and expect to walk away untouched. I mean, think about this. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27 says, Can a man take a fire into his bosom and his clothes not be burned? You can't. There's no way possible. People justify it over and over again. Well, I could just look at it. Or if I just have a little piece of, you know, of this food, I'll be fine. Or if I do this, or if I do just a little bit, you're not going to walk away untouched. For a person that, you know, that deals with alcohol, a good place for you not to go would be the bar. You say, well, duh. Well, I can go to a restaurant that has a bar, but I'll sit in the area that's not the, rest uh, you know, not the bar. I'll sit off to the side. You're still t uh, tempted yourself because I can guarantee, where is the bar in those restaurants? In the center. We need to do what Joseph did when Potiphar's wife came. Genesis chapter 39, verse 12 says this, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. She tried over and over and over again, and he kept on staying away from her. He's like, no, your husband has put me in charge over all these things. I'm not going to do it. God doesn't want me to do it. Stay away from me. You're a married woman. And she kept throwing herself at him over and over till finally what? She grabs him. He says, you know what? You can have my coat. I don't care. And runs out of there. For some of us, that's what we need to realize. Actually, for all of us, when that temptation happens, leave your coat and run. Whatever that temptation is, run from it. Flee, flight. To overcome the world, we need faith. Faith that Jesus will care, take care of us when, uh, when we willingly give up the attachment to worldly things. Do we truly believe that God's got this? That God's got us? Then we would say, you know what? I have the faith to believe that God's going to take care of me and I don't need that temptation, that sin anymore. If we are loving the world, the Bible says that we are not loving God. And we read about this you know, earlier when I, uh, when I, uh, uh, in, John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, and in James chapter 4, verse 4. If you really want victory over the world, then love Jesus more than you love it. If you love Jesus more, you say, you know what, I, I, you know what, I really don't want to, I just keep going back to television because I, just, I, I see it continually. I mean, just at, you know, anywhere. I'm not talking about at our house all the time. I'm saying like anywhere you go, the TV's on. And if you say, you know what, I am going to take this time instead of watching this YouTube video or instead of watching this TV show or instead of watching these commercials or instead of whatever and say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to send you know, for this half hour, I'm going to read God's word. 
That's a half hour of junk that you don't have in your life. And as I heard when I was younger, garbage in, garbage out. That's not only applicable you know, uh, to, to your spiritual life, but it is also you know, uh, you know, for your eating life. If you're always eating garbage food or junk food, your life is, you know, your body's going to, you know, resemble that. Right? Sorry about the hot dogs. But what, is, uh, what does God's word say about, you know, loving Jesus more than the world? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of of the throne of God. If we keep our eyes focused upon him, then we don't have to worry about those things. If you want to know, if there's that, you know, that Christian you look up to and you're going, man, I just, I just want a relationship like they have. Or you know, you was, I'm not saying like you're wanting to copy every single thing that they do, but you just say, you know what? I admire you know, their walk with the Lord. I guarantee it's because they gave up some stuff. Or they gave up a lot because they said, you know what? I want Jesus more than this world. I think of the song, there's a song that I love is by, was it Building 429? Take this world and give me Jesus. What's the next line I'm forgetting? This world is not my home. Yep. And there's that song as well. But I sit there and I think about the fact is, is that this stuff that we, we go through in life, that we want, that we say we have to have, no, we don't. What we need is Jesus. It is, our, it is our faith in him that offers us the victory. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcomes the, wor- overcomes the world, and this is the victory that, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith is... Our faith in him offers us the victory. And last in this one, to overcome the devil, we must fight. We must fight. If we stand up to him and fight, he will flee. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If we would submit our, you know, if we would resist that temptation, resist the devil, you know, of him, you know, just putting it out there, pointing us towards it. If we, if we would resist it, you know what? What does it say? That he's going to flee from you. You cannot run away from sin, but you can drive him away, uh, drive the devil away from you. Why? Because you can't fight the enemy in your own strength, but you can fight uh, the enemy in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is power in the blood. There is power in the blood. So you, when you fight, you know what? It's a good idea to bring Jesus along with you. Fight Satan, fight Satan, and he will flee. Well, how? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. It says, don't give, don't give any place to the devil. When the devil shows up and says, hey, do this, 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 don't give him all the place. What does that mean? Don't let him basically, you know, sit up next to you on the couch and sit there and continue to talk in your ear. You know what? Resist him, kick him out of the house and say, get out of here. And you know what? And he's going to flee in Jesus' name, right? First, uh, First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So the thing is, is that if he's out walking around seeking whom he may devour, and he realizes that you're willing to fight, you know, you know, uh, with the blood of Jesus Christ, he's not going to stay around. He's going to go after somebody else. I mean, think about this: when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan used the Bible. Against Jesus, the Word, the Living Word. And if we don't think that Satan is going to try and use the Bible against us and our temptations, then we're sadly mistaken. But how did Jesus fight back? 
he knew the word. He knew the context of the word and what you know, Satan was saying. And Jesus always came back at him and said, you know what? No, this is what it means. This is what it is. This is what it is. And what happened? Satan left. That's why I always say, not for, yourself, not for you to go you know, out and cherry pick a verse. Oh, this one speaks to me. This is what it, and, that ver- and you can sit there and, and read that and go, oh, man, the, the, it speaks to me. It just does. This is my life verse. Read the context of what you're reading. Because oftentimes people say, I've met people that, I've met people, okay, I, I shared this one a little bit yesterday at, at men's breakfast. That people said that it was okay for us to lie, as, you know, it was okay for us to lie to non-saved people. They used the scripture verse, you know, the scripture passage where Abraham tells, you know, the king that Sarah is his sister. Which we know that Sarah obviously is his wife. He wasn't technically, you know, like some people say, well, he wasn't technically lying. It was only a half-truth. Half-truth is still a lie. In which, yes, you know, Sarah was her, uh, her father's daughter, but not, you know, he was, uh, sorry, yeah, the father's daughter, but not um, the mother's. So there was like that half-sister part of it. So anyways, but I've heard a person preach an entire sermon saying it's okay for you to lie to non-believers, just like Abraham did. When you read the Bible, okay, this is 100% true, right? Absolute truth, right? This is 100% true. So when you read the Bible, realize the Bible will record what actually happened, right? Truthfully. What people actually said, right? But not everything that people had said in the Bible was true. Now think about That's why you need to know context. You say, well, what do you mean not everything is true? Well, think about this. Mary, when speaking to her 12-year-old, you know, you know the, the, the 12-year-old son of God, you know, uh, when he, he stayed at the temple, she came back, she said, your father and your, uh, your father and I, you're basically, you know, your father and I, you know, we're wondering where you're at. You know, how did he respond? Because the Bible records exactly what she said. She said, what? Your father and I, we're wondering where you're at. So that's true in what she, you know, what she said is true, right? As far as what she said. The statement is not true. Because Jesus responds and says, you know, I was about my father's business. Joseph is not, her, you know, Jesus' father. Mary is not, you know, his mother. So the Bible records what Mary said. That statement is not true, but it recorded 100% of what she said is, you know, this is what she said. What she said was not true. That was a lie. You get what I'm saying? So you need to know the context in what you're, do, uh, you know, what you're reading. So the Bible is 100% true. It records the, the events and the sayings of how people said it as, you know, this is 100% of what they said as being true, right? But the people oftentimes when speaking, di- you know, lied, right? There were people that lied. Like when they're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar says that you need to bow down before me. You know, uh, to uh, to the you know to the three Hebrew children. That statement is a lie, but that's actually what he said. You shouldn't follow what he said. You shouldn't make your life saying, you know, what? I'm going to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar because that's what the Bible tells me to do. No, it doesn't. Right? What I want you you know us to realize is that we uh, when we build something or, you know, build a doctrine off of something, make sure that you're reading it in context because context is everything. Amen? You believe 100% of what, when the Bible says that God spoke, you can believe that. That's 100% truth because God never lies. But when it's saying that, you know, when it's quoting a person, they could be telling the truth or a lie because why? Because that's a human. That's a person, right? Whatever the need, whatever the trial, whatever the mountain or the temptation you are fighting against, know this. Number one, God allowed it in your life 
God allows certain things, God allows your life to happen how it is, right? But Satan brought the temptation to your mind. He, God will allow things just like he did with Job. Satan came around asking, you know, who, who he could take care of, right? And what ended up happening, and God said, you know what? I'll allow it. Number two, you are able to handle it through Jesus Christ, whatever that temptation is, wherever that mountain is. Number three, you will be much better, a much better Christian on the other side of it. Why? Because Jesus Christ gives us the victory through him.